Welcome to everybody. Good evening at the first formal dinner of uh, Tuesday of Trinity term. Uh, <clears throat> after a day of heavy rain, uh, we can say that summer has set in with its usual severity. Oxford is in West entirely empty, with deserted streets and pretty well everything boarded up. Now, is this unprecedented in the city's thousand year history? We often hear of the unhealthy climate of Oxford, of Thames Valley Syndrome, and conspiracy theory leads us to wonder if the choice of Oxford as the site of Britain's premier university was part of a royal cunning plan. Keep the intellectuals at arm's length from the seat of power in a marshy area where chronic chest complaints would stop them from making mischief. It's significant that the Romans hadn't bothered with settling Oxford, preferring the bracing air of Bicester village. But the Saxons weren't so choosy, nor were the Normans, and we soon found ourselves with a university colonised by refugees from the bracing air and bistros of Paris, with about a thousand scholars. The problem was that the good burghers of Oxford were less enthusiastic about the invasion of Clarks. Just over 800 years ago, in 1209, town and gown clashed when a woman was found dead, supposedly killed accidentally by a student in the liberal arts who promptly fled the city. The mayor decided to arrest his housemates who protested their innocence, but were, on the orders of good King John, imprisoned and then summarily hanged outside the city, despite benefit of clergy or any kind of trial. An early unimpeachable source, Roger of Wendover, records, and I quote, when the deed had been done, both masters and pupils, to the number of 3,000 clerks, left Oxford so that no one remained out of the whole university. They left Oxford empty, some engaging in liberal studies in Cambridge and some in Reading. Now, there is no evidence that there were anything like 3,000 dons and students here, but that large numbers left the city is certain, and some of them went to a small town in East Anglia where they founded Britain's second university. There was serious concern that this suspendium clericorum, which left the university empty and deserted, might lead to a permanent dispersal of studies here. But the Pope, who had placed less good King John under an interdict, sent a legate to settle the dispute. He found in favour of the university, imposing for the hanging of the clerks a fine on the city of Oxford of 52 shillings a year in perpetuity, it's about £2.50, to be paid to the university and to provide a dinner for a hundred poor scholars every year on St. Nicholas Day, the 6th of December. This is a tradition that ought to be revived. This should have settled it for 800 years, but then there was the bracing air of Northampton. In 1261, this market town, more famous for shoes and leather, was granted a charter by Henry III to set up a university which attracted large numbers of scholars from Oxford and Cambridge, where there had been town and gown riots. This threat lasted four years, but proved to be short-lived because the king, after winning the Battle of Northampton against his rebellious barons, sent the town a message. I quote, We have learned on the testimony of men worthy of belief that if the university remains in Northampton, no small damage would be incurred by our borough of Oxford, which is of ancient creation, confirmed by our ancestors, and is generally approved as a convenience to students. We should on no grounds be willing that this should happen, especially as all the bishops agree that for the honour of God, the advantage of the Church of England, and the well-being of the students, the university should be removed from Northampton. Great sighs of relief in Oxford after much hard lobbying, but were they safe yet? 
University life continued beset by violence and chaos, by frequent battles between students and between students and other communities within the town, such as the riots of St Scholastica's day. Oxford was divided, for instance, between factions of students from the north and the south of England. Northern colleges like Bresno's Hall and southern colleges like Exeter. When armed conflict ensued between them, some dissatisfied northern Oxford scholars from Brasenose and Merton decamped in 1333 to escape this internecine dispute and founded a new university, not in Reading, not in Northampton, but in Stamford in Lincolnshire. Dissidents arrived in waves from 33 to 34 to the consternation of their alma mater. They are said to have brought with them a bronze knocker, which they fixed to the door of the hall which they occupied in their newly adopted home, and encouraged by the townsfolk, the Oxford academic read lectures, held debates, and taught many of the local youth. This threat was once again resolved by royal decree, when the universities of Oxford and Cambridge petitioned King Edward III, who suppressed the neo-university, and ordered the masters and clerks to return to Oxford. Thereafter, until the 1820s, no new universities were founded in England, were allowed to be founded in England, not even in London. Thus, Oxford and Cambridge had this duopoly, which was unusual in large Western European countries. And no third English university was created till the 19th century. While Scotland had four founded before 1600. To enforce this closed shop, from 1335 onwards, graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, as you will be, were required to swear the Stamford Oath that they would not give lectures outside these two English universities. And it was in Latin, item vos dabitis fidem, you shall also swear that you will not read lectures or hear them read at Stamford, as in a university study or college general. Do fidem. This oath remained in place nearly 500 years until 1827, and it wasn't till 1890 that the bros or bronze knocker was returned to Oxford, but Brezno's had to buy the whole house just to take it back. Hardly were they reinstalled when a virus intervened. Some believe that the Black Death, which had swept Europe and killed perhaps a third of the population, hit Oxford just as badly. It struck in November 1348 and raged till the following June. The numbers of wills registered suggest that mortality was high in Oxford. Two mares were carried off, as were the Abbess of Godstow near the Trout Inn and the Prioress of Littlemore near Ifley. Two chancellors of the university and two provosts of Oriel, unwise folk. But the colleges and religious houses, like St Frideswide's Priory on the site of Christchurch, actually seem to have escaped more likely, perhaps because the residents were better fed and so healthier, and of course they could easily shut themselves off from the town. It also seems that masters and students fled at the first sight of pestilence as it travelled up the Thames. I quote, escape plans were well worked out and countryside manors were designated as places of retreat for continuing education. So we have social isolating avant la lettre. The ordinary residents of the town had no such recourse. The effect was catastrophic. The town impoverished, the population dropped heavily, leaving large vacant sites within the town walls. For instance, a 13-acre site in the northeast corner of the town, between Hollywell and Queen's Lane, was identified as soon as 1349 as uninhabited, a place of gravel pits and sand pits where robbers lurked. The site was confirmed in 1378 as neither built up nor enclosed, a dump for filth and corpses, a resort of criminals and prostitutes. An enterprising past and future Lord Chancellor of England, William of Wickham, whose revenue as Bishop of Winchester, derived in part from London brothels near London Bridge, the Southwark Stews, decided not to bring his fallen ladies to Oxford, 
but instead to snap up the vacant plot and to found a new college called the College of St Mary or New College. A condition of Royal Richard II's royal grant was that the college should keep the town wall in repair. If you've wondered how that college managed to get its hands on such a huge site within the walls and how the medieval walls survived, you have your answer. As new colleges were founded, they too tried to find a bolt hole in the country as it falls away from a pestilence. There was rarely a time when some sort of disease, influenza, typhoid, malaria, and later cholera, wasn't raging across the country and particularly in cities. Christchurch, for instance, soon after its foundation, purchased a property in Wallingford, especially to be a place of refuge, at least for the senior members, during times of infection. Far away to be safe, but close enough for business to continue as usual. It was substantial property, with various lodgings, stables, gardens and orchards to keep the residents supplied with fresh fruit and vegetables. We know that at least some members of Christchurch were resident there in the 16th century. Roles were reversed in 1665 when the plague broke out in London. By October, 70,000 people had died in the capital alone. As the virus spread out across the countryside, there was panic. Cambridge University was closed, and Isaac Newton quarantined himself in his childhood home, using the time profitably to develop calculus and the theory of gravity. Something good comes out of adversity. A watch was posted at Oxford's gate, I quote, to keep out infected persons. Travel restrictions, stay at home. But it didn't prevent Charles II, his court, parliament and the judiciary from decamping from London, deciding Oxford was a far better and healthier place to be, and moving here in September with the king staying in Christchurch and his queen in Merton. They remained till February, so Oxford was not closed, not evacuated, but very full indeed. Unlike the Black Death, and unlike Cambridge, there seems to have been very little sign of the plague here, as Anthony R. Wood recorded, I quote, we have not the least show of infection of plague among us. Oxford was badly hit by cholera in 1832 and 1854, as was much of England, because of the filthy state of the rivers. But the university didn't have to close, because the disease struck each time at the beginning of the long vacation and went away providentially in October, when the students returned. It was the work of an Oxford medic, Sir Henry Ackland, that later helped protect the city from any future outbreak of cholera, an omen, I think, for today. Of course, there were other times when Oxford was almost empty, such as during the First World War, when 90% of its 3,000 students and its staff went off to fight. They returned to a city hit by the Spanish flu, which caused chaos and saw the first widespread use of face masks in public. But it's still hard to find a precedent for the current drastic closure, lockdown and quarantining, for the empty streets and the shuttered up shops. But we can still pray, and I take a glass in my hand to raise to your health, we can still pray that for Henry Ackland's successors in Oxford Medicine, to whom we wish every success, will find a remedy so that, as in 1832 and 1854, the pestilence will go away just in time for students to come up again in October for Michaelmas term. Good health to you and your families, and thank you for listening.